Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Carolyn Harris, you win the award for the first on the Zoom meeting, so you get a gold star today. Yeah, she's on Island Hall. We need to. Is she on Island Hall? Well, we need to give her some uh, We should like speak with our Southern Foghorn Leghorn accent then. Uh, I'll accent? say, I'll say, Carolyn. What about our jealous accent? Uh, well, there we go. We could do that as well. Well, good morning, all. We, uh, I, I anticipate we might have a few more uh, straggling in. Here we are in the. Uh, the middle of uh, of July and uh, a little more than halfway through the book. Um, we have a ringer today, and I wonder if uh, uh, she could say a word of, uh, of hello. I, I think most may know Claire, but maybe not everybody. So Claire, the Reverend Claire Berry, welcome. And uh, Claire is gonna be filling in for me next week. So she thought it might not be a bad idea to come this week to figure <laughs> out what it's. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm Claire Berry. I do know many of you, um, but I am the UPERC Nashville campus minister, and I'm also doing some work supporting the pastors this summer while Donovan is away on sabbatical. So I grew up in the church. Um, this is, you know, not what good Pastor Hall used to look like, you know, um, and uh, it's uh, fun to be getting reacquainted um, in the past two years that I've been with you, Kirk, because prior to that, I was not not living here for a very long time. So it's, it's good to see you all, and um, I love having a chance to dive into this book. I was telling Mary that right before I found out that this is what we were going to be studying, a student was telling me all about the author and asking if I read anything by her, and, um, and then I can say that I have. <laughs> say too, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Claire, a little bit about your ministry context before coming back here, because I think that might be important, especially in conversation with this book. Yeah, sure. So I, um, after graduating from Princeton Seminary, the right seminary. <laughs> right. Our old potter. Stephanie, can we get an amen? Okay. <laughs> Stephanie is an alum. I've heard it's the left seminary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I uh, went to um, Austin, Texas, um, which uh, to serve a large suburban congregation. I was an associate there in um, as the minister of mission. So kind of you know, thinking about the way the church engages the public. Um, sphere and it's certainly a place where um, some of these culture wars issues are very uh, live and maybe a bit more out in the open and so this has been interesting to to read um, and then kind of where uh, Christian masculinity and how that an idea of that has taken has taken shape not really something I explored that deeply but certainly had some um, experiences with yeah i would think anecdotal yes. uh uh would yes. be uh probably uh, and the double whammy of being in texas and then uh, evangelical there yes. i would imagine yes. it's, uh, yes. it's something anyway good well welcome uh all and have you made the acquaintance of stephanie boaz yet claire in the back yes. no, <laughs> yeah so uh, and the week afterwards, I think I sent in the letter, um, Carol, although I not I've I've done one of those unpardonable things. Carol said she would be willing to teach, but I had not confirmed that with her before sending out the letter yesterday. So she found out uh, like the rest of you that uh, she's she's on. So uh, sorry, Carol. Uh, all right. All right. Maybe a good place to start before we even get into this is how aware were you all with the whole Promise Keepers movement? Oh, yeah. Yeah, fair bit. Okay. Um, I, I think I mentioned in passing last week that the church I was serving in Libertyville, Illinois, uh, there was a, a group of guys there for whom this was an important thing and uh, convinced a uh, a busload of us to go down to Indianapolis for this convention and uh, we had to stay you know out, way outside of Indianapolis the book talks about how there were no uh, hotel rooms in Indianapolis I mean everything sold out so 
you know, we're schlepping, I don't know, 45 minutes away after this thing is over and cramming people into rooms. And it's like, oh, it was so great. And I'm thinking, man, that it just did not speak to me. And then a couple of years later, some of these guys thought it was their responsibility to send their pastor to Atlanta for another Promise Keepers event that was geared toward uh, pastors. And so I had the uh, experience of going to one of those there as well. And I can say, and we'll get into this more in the book, the one thing I do appreciate was where they ended up on race. And uh, for, you know, it, within the mainline denomination, we had been talking about race stuff for a while, but this was the first time that the evangelical world tried to address some of that. And uh, as I said, they, you know, received some backlash uh, for it, but um, uh, it, it's it's just one of those things that uh, um, kind of gets to you. And I always think about one of my dear buddies growing up, a guy named Johnny Krupka, uh, and John was the captain of our soccer team and co-captain of the band and volleyball team. And we had a volleyball coach named Ted Martz, who was really just kind of in your face kind of guy. He's yelling at John, you know, come on, get up, get up. John is a engineer. <laughs> and my own personality sort of peaks and valleys. John is just this calm, cool, collected guy. And I remember looking at Ted and says, I'm up. You know, I just that kind of get going. It's just like uh, not everybody hits on that uh, string. It's <laughs> kind of interesting. All right. So 97 kind of thinking about uh, where we are, uh, stand in the gap. Um, McCartney, it, it didn't mention in this uh, chapter, it does mention about the issue with his daughter and uh, the child out of wedlock with one of the football players and all of that. But I believe later it came out that um, uh, McCartney himself had a little challenge keeping promises to his wife in their marital promises uh, here and there. So, you know, that some of this may be thou protestest too, too mightily um, as well, but nevertheless, um, and Colorado is just a hotbed of evangelicalism and Colorado Springs, uh, especially uh, Boulder. Uh, there's some really strong churches. We had we had very strong Presbyterian churches in both Boulder and uh, Colorado Springs uh, that have left the denomination. Um, and I wish Dana Brooks were here because Dana, Dana's not on yet. No, Dana had been member of the Boulder church and can give us a little bit of perspective of, of that as well. Okay. So, yeah. Did you read the paper this week about the uh, migration of Southerners west mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, after the Civil War, most of the elite Southerners who had nothing after the war moved out west. So Ashley didn't stay in the south, he moved out west. Well, um, 12 Oaks gets destroyed, and so he heads out west. That's right. Yeah, and uh, a lot of these um, early evangelical. Uh, individuals have come from those roots. West. And my guess is they probably have come from that southern migration roots and then become evangelicals with a little bit of background of segregational uh, yeah. experience. It, it is interesting. Um, if you know the history of Portland, Oregon, Portland, Oregon was a sundown town. So the issue of race out there uh, is massive. And uh, so thanks uh, for holding that. It was a very interesting article. I did not see it. So, um, you know, you, you and, and Mary can be some of my research uh, assistants. So if you can think to send me that, I'd be, I'd be grateful to it. As I said in the letter yesterday, isn't it interesting? We're reading this and it's like a magnet pulling some of these other things to it, isn't it? You, you kind of see these things all over the place that maybe you hadn't missed as well. But to that point, what's interesting is um, my position at this church in Libertyville, Illinois, was a group of Southerners 
had gone up to work at Abbott and Baxter Laboratories and uh, the old Northern Presbyterian Church. Do any of you come out of the Northern Presbyterian stream? Stephanie, kind of, sort of, maybe. Uh, you, you do well. Historically, there wasn't robust Sunday school for adults. And in fact, the church I served in Libertyville was 2,400 members. Our children's Sunday school ran concurrent to worship. And there was no Sunday school then for adults on Sunday morning. And these folks who came out of the South of like, you know, what about for us? So I got hired to develop a, a you know, formation, discipleship, adult education program in the church. And one of the things we had to figure out is how to do Sunday school. So I, I, I recruited a team and we had to figure out first a children's Sunday school hour that was different than what Sunday school was. So we put on a play. I mean, we had modules within that hour. We do 10 minutes of this, 10 minutes of this, and then a half an hour of, you know, doing a play. It was very successful. But that was the only way that I could do something for adults on Sunday morning. Uh, and then we, we, our big service was the 9 a.m. service. We had 9 and 11. And uh, I convinced them to allow me to do a disciple class on Sunday morning that started at 10 and went through noon. And so the only time I was not, I was in the late worship service was when I was preaching uh, for that year, which uh, was kind of crazy. Anyway, I, I digress, but I think your, your point is right. Migration. And the other thing that we need to just keep remembering in the back is what's happening economically. How does that work in the midst of this? Uh, how is economy changing and the kinds of jobs and what men are doing and, and, um, and all of that? Speaking of jobs, what they said was all these people were comfortable with large plantations, lots of work agricultural yeah and so they went to places where they could replicate that replicate that with uh big plots and lots of farm hands uh, and uh, migrant workers and so on wow I, I i'm gonna look forward to reading that thank you um all right patricia ireland uh recognizes pretty early on that this might be a threat to women's rights <laughs> um, bottom of uh, 150, the promise keepers seem to think women will be so thrilled that men are promising to take responsibility in their families that we will take the back seat in this and every other area of our lives. Now, I have to say something. I knew promise keepers not well, but I worked with a woman who was mm. newly married and her husband belonged said, oh, I'm going to do this. She was difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, and I think she brings this out, that, I mean, there are a lot of places where the women are are very much in support of this. Yeah. Uh, it built itself as a political organization. Um, she was skeptical when she saw the men gather in D.C. She saw hundreds and thousands of names on a direct mail list. Um Stealth political cells. Um, it's interesting. I had not thought about that when I was aware of Promise Keepers. So I think it's pretty prescient. Um, and again, as I've said a week or two ago, you know, follow the money in this becomes uh, really important. Um, Dana, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Were you out in Colorado when this was going on, or had you already shifted back to Nashville? We were living in Nashville, but we still had a condo in Boulder, which was directly across, across 28th from Folsom Stadium, where the first big Promise Keepers was held, and the whole area was lit up by the stadium lights, and you could sit out on our balcony and hear them. They were everywhere. Yeah. Before you jumped on, Dan, I was mentioning um, Colorado and the Boulder Church. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it went from a really good church to uh, to something else, didn't it? When we were out there, and this would have been the uh, late 70s and early 80s, 
Uh, Bob Erder was the pastor of First Boulder and it had between five and 6,000 members. Then the next pastor had an affair with a member. It just went down until the session. Please remember folks, the strongest committee in your church is the nominating committee. Um, enough on the session, they fired the pastor and left the denomination way out something now. The other irony is that Vineyard Christian Church that's mentioned is going quite well. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you, Dana. Um, over 152, however, Promise Keepers was not merely the Christian coalition in disguise. Um, it reached across religious and denominational divides, bringing together Charismatics and Pentecostals with Southern Baptists, Methodists, and the growing contingent of non-denominational evangelicals, along with Catholics, liberal Protestants, and Mormons. Many liberal critics failed to realize that Promise Keepers had vocal critics on the right as well as the left. Um, and then it, it talks about this term, soft patriarchy. <clears throat> Uh, what did y'all think about that term? You put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. Uh, for those who didn't hear, <laughs> you can put lipstick on a pig and it's still a pig. Um, pig is happy, but everybody else knows what's going on. Yeah. Spoken like a nurse. Um, <laughs> uh, over on 153, I thought that middle paragraph for a time, both coexisted in creative tension, thanks in part to the idea of servant leadership. Less abrasive than male headship, servant leadership framed male authority as obligation, sacrifice, and service. Men were urged to accept their responsibilities to work hard, to serve their wives and families, to eschew alcohol, gambling, and pornography, to step up around the home, and to be present in their children's lives. The notion of servant leadership had originated in the business world. With the decline of production in the 70s and 80s, service work took over a larger share of the labor market, and servant leadership helped redefine masculine authority in a way that didn't conflict with men's role in a service economy. No longer producers in a traditional sense, men could still be leaders. Within Christian circles, the concept of servant leadership similarly enabled men to maintain their authority in the home even as they no longer maintain breadwinner status. By the 90s, the male breadwinner economy was largely a thing of the past. Um, I think all of that is really, really significant. Um, and not to kind of uh, miss uh, that kind of, uh, kind of shift. Um, and then again, to your point, um, uh, Rosemary, on 154, for women who found this patriarchal garden attractive, the harsh critique level by feminists was alienating and confusing. I mean, what's wrong with having the husband engaged at home in a way and all those kinds of things? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and I, I think it would be fair for us to say that, you know, there is a continuum of experience of men in this kind of program as well. Uh, there were There were some guys in my church in Libertyville who were, sweet, wonderful guys, you know, and this was a, a, a good thing for them. One of the things I loved about that church is actually we had, we had a ton of really, really good guys who were deeply engaged, but also had deep friendships with one another. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things they did is they had a, a, a poker group that would, would play and invited me in to play. And Pardon me? Take your money. They would accept it. One day, one day we were playing, John. This is absolutely true. And all of a sudden the pot grew and doubled and got high, and I won it. And I felt really uncomfortable. I mean, do you remember that scene in uh, Band of Brothers where uh, Dick Winters tells the other lieutenant, don't play cards with the men, don't ever, you know, expect you can take something from them? Uh, I mean, I sort of felt like that. I, I mean, I walked home with a really, really heavy pocket, and I was not feeling comfortable Good. about that. But the, the point wasn't the money. The point was the friendship. And the great thing is they made up names of card games based on the foibles of the church staff. <laughs> right? 
So if they played McKenzie, named after our choir director who had had ophthalmological cancer and lost an eye, this guy would take his baton and if the children were misbehaving in choir, he would wrap it against his fake eyeball or take his eyeball out. He would, I mean, he was legend with those kids. Uh, but if we were playing McKenzie, one-eyed jacks were wild, right? If we were playing Melanie, named after Melanie Hammond Clark, one of the associate pastors, threes were wild because she used her three names. Any idea what, what game we'd play if, if Griffith? Eights were wild because it looks like a snowman, right? I mean, there was some laughter and, and, and levity and great fellowship with this. I went to my church in Charlotte button down Charlotte, right? You know, I get invited to the same group and the guys start talking about the wife. I never went back to that. That, I mean, it was a totally different feel. And uh, I, I'm, I only served the church in Libertyville three years and I'm still deeply close and connected with folks <laughs> in that congregation. Great group. Although interestingly, I, after I left, a conservative went in to take the head of staff position, and within two years, he split that congregation, took 250 members worth 750000 of the budget, and uh, tried to get ordained by another reformed denomination, known would take him, so he started a non-denominational church in the same town, and that great church went from 2400 broad tent church that was slightly evangelical to a 1500 member congregation because of the split that happened there yeah i wonder guys i might throw something in here that i learned about servant leadership yeah so that's a term that i heard in texas a lot mm -hmm. um and it was partly because the church that i served had mission partners predominantly in the Middle East, um, in Afghanistan, among other places, where they'd gotten involved right after um, the war mm -hmm. began. And um, as kind of this Christian patriotic duty, I wasn't here for that. I wasn't there for that. But they had maintained these long relationships. And one of the things they would do is that they would educate they would have these college courses they were involved in, and they were almost always in servant leadership. Mm -hmm. That was the kind of the tagline of what they were. And so it was a way of kind of bringing in both a sort of an American business ideal, but with this kind of sleeping, you know, not technically according to the rules that you could have it be Christian, but bring in this kind of Christian ideal into these Muslim spaces. And so it was interesting for me to see the origins of that. And I think this chapter is also bringing up a question for me, just an open question. I don't have an answer to it, but is there a form of masculinity or is there an ideal of masculinity that, that can be salvaged or that would be yeah. positive? Right. Um, and I, you know, there'll be more on that in this chapter, but that's the question I'm kind of, um, keep coming back to it. I read so. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Actually, I, I mean, there there's a lot of that that is laudable, right? And and we need to hold kind of one another accountable for showing up and being present and being present in a way that is um, self self serving to others, right? I mean, how do I enter yeah. most of my uh, wedding homilies? You know, Paul talks about love, but love always has a referent, and that referent is Jesus. And when Paul's talking about Jesus, he's talking about the cross, and the cross is always self-giving. It's not self-getting. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, and why it might be received well in some marriages or contexts, like you were saying, that um, sorry, your name, but he had a friend who was like, this was great, <laughs> you right. know, because yeah. it was an improvement on another, mm -hmm. perhaps another lived masculinity. So yeah. Good, thank you. Um, then on the bottom of 154, talking about um, 
Tony Evans and um, and all of that. Um, that male supremacy with the beatific smile. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. Claire, um, my husband is in consumer insights and been in the corporate world for a while, and he he didn't he didn't love it. He decided to switch out of it. But um, but the business America, the American business model is very top down too. Mm -hmm. You know, and so even sneaking in that servant sort of leadership. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 155, middle of the page, militaristic rhetoric surfaced at times in PK literature. Speakers referred, preferred sports metaphors to military ones. Mm -hmm. Rallies inevitably took place in sports stadiums. Athletes often took center stage. Um, goes in on uh, 156, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Um, and then uh, Falwell, God wants you to be a champion. Um, thought at the bottom of the page here, in a world destabilized by modern feminism, sports offer disaffected men a masculine haven. Like military metaphors, sports call to mind a world in which men, by virtue of their superior physical strength, still dominated. Both sports and the military, too, reinforced a dualistic view of the world. In athletics, as in battle, there were winners and losers. In this way, sports infused rhetoric and pageantry, allowing promise keepers to address male anxieties while maintaining the semblance of benevolent patriarchy. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Um, I, I do follow some sports, but not all. But at the end of the NBA season, uh, that wonderful athlete with the Greek name who uh, helped me out here, John, uh, who plays for the Bucks. The quarterback. No, the uh, the to, to to come up. Yeah, thank you. Um, Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, to come by, they came up short in the playoffs, and and somebody addressed, you know, you had a, uh, you know, a losing season or something like that, and his response was, you know, we we had a lot of good this season. You know, we didn't win the championship. Maybe we will next year. And people jumped all over oh. this, you know, narrative of like it only works if you're the absolute winner, and the heck with everyone else. And he had this uh, whole different way of addressing that that I thought was incredibly refreshing. You know, go ahead. I, I just have had a conflict for a little bit about uh, public figures broadcasting their Christianity. Right. Uh, the Colorado coach, I presume, is paid by the state of Colorado. And the United States has freedom of religion, and we shouldn't be uh, pushing one way or another. And I agree with that. Uh, and that he's out there starting promise keepers. Uh, I always wonder about some of his football players, whether they feel they all have to be promise keepers on the other right. hand. But uh, I think that being an evangelical has a place too. Right. Um, we had the same thing here, I think, in Tennessee, where they had a prayer service at the football game uh, afterwards, and I think initially the coach was told not to do that, and then he appealed to the courts, mm -hmm. and he was told he could make all his players come and yeah. have a, I don't think make, right. invite them, but if your coach is there and saying, I'd like everybody to come out to the football field and have a prayer. So I am having a struggle of yep. um, where do I go in, in this uh, spreading the gospel um, versus saying that's not quite freedom of religion. Right. I, I think you, my hunch is you're not alone in this room uh, in that struggle. And I think you're especially right in, you know, what is the boundary marker when you're, you know, it's very different if you're the coach of Wheaton College, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, Rhodes, where my son went, uh, Davidson, that has a history. It's a very different thing 
when you're the coach of the state institution and likely as the football coach of the state football team of a large, you're likely the highest paid state employee in, in the entire state, right? You know, so I think you're absolutely right. I had the same thing when I was a doctor and had patients who were terminally ill. Yeah. And would be working at, for instance, the Veterans Hospital. And how forceful do you talk to somebody about your faith? Yeah. And if you push that too much, it, it, you're going the wrong way in terms yeah. of freedom of religion. On the other hand, you'd like to be of some help. Yeah. Uh, I, one way I worked around that is would ask, would they like to see a chaplain? Uh, and if you think that would be of help, but it's still a conflict for yeah. how you ought to um, yeah. interact. Yeah. And, and again, one of the other things I, I guess I would say is a, a very um, a very particular way of demonstrating Christianity in that moment, right? Uh, and and a, a very certain kind of Christianity that that, that gets uh, in place there. Thank you. That's uh, really good. Again, over on one fifty seven. Um, at the very top, it was when the evangelical men's moment elevated sports as the preferred metaphor for Christian manhood that racial reconciliation emerged as a guiding purpose. Uh, one of the few white Christian organizations in the country willing to take on racism. Um, although there's, you know, how much of that, I, I really thought this whole notion uh, about framing racism as a personal failure at times, even as a mutual problem, PK speakers routinely fail to address structural inequalities. And uh, that's, you know, constantly one of the issues. Well, you know, I, I'm not a racist. Therefore, uh, when the system that we're in uh, is one that um, we benefit from, and, you know, how do we, how do we come to grips with, with that as well? Um, John Perkins, is that a name known to many of you? He's worth knowing. He's out of Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, African American, very still involved in in um, civil rights. And a number of close friends of mine went and worked with him. In fact, I think Beth Drake went down and worked with his organization when she was an undergraduate, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, but he's somebody, go ahead and circle that name, uh, really worthwhile uh, knowing. John Perkins. John Perkins, yeah. Uh, and then over on 158, uh, in 96, for instance, 40% complaints registered by conference participants were negative responses to the theme of racial reconciliation. Mm -hmm. The fall off in attendance a significant decline in revenue. Um, and I, th I, I went back and looked. I think it was in the summer of 94 that I went to the Indianapolis one, and it was in 96, February of 96, that the Atlanta event took place. And, and this was interesting to me in 58, at bottom of 158, the uh, spawning dozens of smaller denominational ministries, uh, Southern Baptist, Assemblies of God, Presbyterian Church USA developed men's Bible study series. I remember looking at that and thinking, eh, I'm taking a pass. <laughs> um, yeah. But then again, follow the money. The proliferation of men's groups sparked a minor revolution in Christian publishing and retailing industry. I was hoping uh, Carol West was going to be here today to find out if some of this passed with her when she worked for um, for uh, Nelson Publishing, Thomas Nelson. Then I, I hadn't thought that I was going to see the name Robert Bly again. How many of you remember that whole moment with men's stuff with Robert Bly? Vaguely. Oh, yeah. Vaguely? Iron John. Iron John, oh, yeah. yeah. 
you know, get a drum and beat yeah. the drum and oh, oh my drum. lord, just oh, yeah. shoot me now. Um, <laughs> this heroic quest, uh, you know, I think if I remember, uh, just go out and do work. Um, <laughs> Uh, about that though is that Robert Wise's work very much got picked up on the kind of progressive end of Christianity as well. Yeah, it's Richard Rohr's work a lot. Yep. And this idea that you have to have kind of a quest and a rite of passage it fits in well with the union emphasis on that side of the spectrum. Right. And so I was actually surprised to read about it here. Yeah. I read about it in the in the Lucy Goosey Woo Woo Hall. <laughs> some of the Christianity that I'm, I'm uh, a part of. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it, it is interesting. You know, you, you always hear that, well, you know, the Maasai warriors have their children go through this and, you know, we need that uh, defining moment. Where was it that I saw that um, you're supposed to take your teenage son out and buy him, you know, expensive gifts and guns and stuff like that? I don't think <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Uh, um, uh, middle of 161, unfortunately, the church was part of the problem, failing to present the true Jesus and instead depicted Jesus as meek and gentle, milk toast character, a man who never could have inspired brawny fishermen like Peter to follow him. It was time to place a Sunday school Jesus with a warrior Jesus. Uh, citing significant parallels between serving Christ and serving in the military, uh, Dalby suggested that a redeemed image of the warrior could reinvigorate the church's ministry to men. What if we told men up front that to join the church, Jesus Christ is to enlist in God's army and to place their lives under the line? What do you all think about that? Stephanie? Continue to be really sad and offended that this whole thing really says men need to have weapons and fight and safe but exciting sex at home. And that's what masculinity is. Yeah. I just think that is just so yes. Yeah. And so unfair to the fullness of any man I know. Right. Yeah, how limiting this is. I haven't seen anything about painting great pictures for instance, or writing a decent poem. You know, the, I mean, the, the spectrum of this is so narrow yeah. in what understanding um, the fullness of who we are as God's children is. Uh, it's really uh, problematic. I did want to say, I'll get you in a second, Kip. Uh, how many of you know the work of Gideon's Army here in town? Mm -hmm. and, and yet, you know, so there's part of me that, you know, I don't want to throw away I know I'm speaking heresy here, and I'm going to tell a story on Claire Berry in a minute. Um, um, so I went to Claire's granddaddy's funeral out at the historic Presbyterian Church in Franklin. And the final concluding hymn of that service was Onward Christian Soldiers. And I said to Doug, I'm pretty certain that's the first time your children have sung that hymn in a Presbyterian church. Uh, but there is something about uh, he who would valiant be midst all. I mean, you know, there, there's something about this that I think we are uh, loathe and we miss if we under, if we if we fail to understand that there is something more than just me and Jesus. I mean, that there is kind of a struggle that we're in with this faith, right? And that we're invited to come. But that's one of many metaphors that we can use, not the only metaphor. And, and to me, that's the problem when this gets privileged over everything else. On the other hand, I'm a little uncomfortable when that metaphor is totally dropped. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, Carolyn? I just have that feeling the whole time in this. How did we, how did we, or do we, um, get so hung up on a tiny bit of the whole that all the rest we condemn or I don't know it just confuses me because I just see this happening this way and that way and it all ends up so negative and it just I don't know and I, I sort of 
It, 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 it often not only ends up negative, but it ends up with one subset of God's creatures getting more benefits than everybody else, right? That that becomes part of the, where in here did it say, uh, Lord? Remember, we're talking about the husband being Lord, right? Small L, Lord. Now, I've got a capital L because I rode off to Scotland and got, a, I've got like a, and a uh, a square foot of land in Scotland that allows Amy and me to be lords and lady, right? So, so that kind of yeah, that kind of lord. Yeah, so not the other. Kim, you wanted to say something? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm just writing down three overriding thoughts I had to this point. And one is the futility of at a Picking whatever task it is, whatever thought it is, and putting a gender assignment to it. My dad started running a household when he was 13. His only child lost his mother. Right. He had three daughters. <laughs> he didn't miss a son at all. I mean, I learned how to shoot. I learned how to paint. I learned how to train dogs. We all did. I learned how to cook. So he did what was needed. Which doesn't um, make me say that when you have the um, the evangelical idea of the ideal family, that works. That works too. Right. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Right. And the idea that we all have to be under the same umbrella right. goes against me. And the other two thoughts I don't remember right now. Yeah. <laughs> Except one was when you were talking about Christianity with public figures. My feeling about evangelism, when, when I go to talk about my faith with somebody, it's pretty much on a one to one, and it's pretty much an invitation and what it means to me. Mm -hmm. After that, it is up to God. Mm -hmm. And to ram it down their throat yeah. and to say, you're wrong for this and you're wrong for that, backfire. Yeah. It, it's an invitation. It's not. It's not a rule. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that was the second thought. The third one I'll say. You'll, you'll come, come in. Yeah. Um, for me, actually, fighting for something doesn't necessarily involve weapons or force of, you know, physical right. force. Uh, you can develop uh, the strength to fight for something without having that be part of the make. Yeah. Thank you. Um, over on 162, um, the end of that top paragraph, um, only a generation or two removed from the so-called working class, professional men of this generation found themselves caught between an image of our physically hardworking grandfathers in farms and factories and the white collar professionals in antiseptic office buildings. Despite pressure for men to achieve higher socioeconomic status, and despite the nascent popularity of servant leadership, American culture still associated masculinity with working class jobs. Times were confusing indeed. Do you all agree with that? I agree that it's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, go ahead, Janet. Right back to the beginning of the book on page 17, that I talked about things about hyper masculinity appeals to men anxious about their own status. Right. You know, the story about the gentleman coming out of the cowboy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and I would say the question was like, who was presented before? And I think what underlies all this is anxiety. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How that, that comes up, you know. Though, though that, you know, my grandfather was a quarryman, um, I have never once felt the need to get a hammer and a chisel and go, you know, cut marble out of, or slate or anything like that. I, to me, I, I, I get this, but I don't understand it. I find it good. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I, I think she makes a very nice point and it uh, pertains to a group of people, but most of the people I knew growing up through this period of time, 
Thomas Keepers wasn't a big, uh, didn't have a big effect. Right. Uh, Jerry Falwell was a clown. Right. I thought, uh, well, I'm not sure that this thesis she makes pertains to all males. Everyone, all always, people. everywhere. I think you're right. And yeah. But there is a certain group that I can associate with this. But yeah. Uh, Emily? Uh, it just reminds me, um, and that's an option talk. We have so many friends, male friends that drive like huge pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. And it's like they go to their white collar job in their suits and they come home and they don't even as much as garden. You know, they buy <laughs> something they want. They don't have the biggest truck and they're making $20,000 on it. And I don't think that's funny. I'm like, they're just trying to, that's their asserting their masculinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or something that, you know. It's true. You like to drive a truck. That's fine. But it may be kind of harking back to a great daddy drove a truck. Yeah. Because he worked on a farm, and now they are because that's the image they want to portray. Yeah. Cool culture. Yet along those lines, I had the similar thoughts when I lived in Philadelphia, outside of Philadelphia. The only people that drove a truck, and more often they drove a big van because you could secure things, were people who were in construction. And then when I moved to Texas, I mean, and women too. I mean, they use truck for anything, but they have, they have to have one. But, um, and on the highway, I mean, high post silk, get out of their way. <laughs> it, it was terrifying sometimes. Um, but yeah, they didn't need a truck for their work. <laughs> yeah, um... I, I love driving trucks. Yeah. I always I grew up learning how on a tractor, and then I got to drive a truck because that was the lowest on the totem pole when I was a new driver. Um, I drove my son in law, and I love to drive his 350 dual. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is why I don't see gender assignment. Mm -hmm. at, you know, it just to me, it's foolish. Your point, Chad, to anxiety, I think um, evangelical, the people that we're talking about who are different from the way most of us believe, they want black and white because right. you don't have to think. Right. You're told. Mm -hmm. The gray areas are much harder to live with. And my sister has trouble with gray areas. Right. Yeah. The other one, no. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and get your pencils or pens out. Uh, who is the greatest poet of our generation? There's a gold star for this answer. You're not going to say Bob Dylan. Or what? Our generation. Close. Close. Bruce Springsteen. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Bob Dylan. Yeah. You, you go for Dylan. Well, Springsteen has this great line It's a sad man, my friend living in his own skin, who can't stand the company. And Janet, to your point, I mean, this anxiety stuff. Who am I? What am I? What am I supposed to be? All of those kinds of things. And um, I, I think it is fair to say, you know, when, when you were living on a farm and you knew you were going to farm or, you know, my granddaddy, Barryman, you know, is there. Well, now I've got to figure out what does that look like? I don't think that's unique to men. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I don't think that's unique to men. And certainly, you know, a lot of us know about the, um, um, what's it called? The syndrome. Uh, imposter. Imposter syndrome. You know, mm -hmm. gosh, am I ever good enough? All those kinds of things. But uh, I do think some of that comes back to feeling comfortable with who we are and realizing that what I do for a living isn't necessarily who I am, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, how do we how do we get comfortable with who we are? And you know, to a certain extent, our central identity is: I've been baptized by God. I'm a child of God, right? If we live out of that, that's a very different kind of thing. Then my sense of vocation is: How do I be a Christian in the world? And it so happens that I'm living out that vocation as a minister, but I could have easily done that as something else. 
my my understanding of who I am is based first and foremost that I'm a child of God. I've been claimed by the waters of baptism. Right? That's a very different vision than, you know, what do I do? Yeah. Carol? Um, reading this book has kind of opened my eyes to see why Christianity is falling in this country. Um, and it's also opened my eyes to live on Fairfax, and just within a couple of blocks, there are like three different non denominational churches one in two schools and one in the roof. And I kept thinking, why are these, you know, non denominational churches not everywhere? And let me tell you, the one across the street is Asian, and many people there are from the East. Yeah. In mm. that. Yeah. And this has made me realize it's just they repackage constantly. You know, it's like the promise keepers with this and they screw yeah. out of it and this and that. Um, but they are these evangelical non denominational churches. Yeah. So, and, and I think they probably, if I went to one of them, you would find. Well, this one didn't like the fact that women couldn't do this, and this one doesn't like that. Right. But they're still, at their heart, very evangelical. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. I thought uh, over the top of 163, uh, war has been declared upon the family, on your family and mine. Leading a family through the chaos of American culture is like leading a small patrol. Through the enemy occupied territory. I've written down foolish. Yeah. That is absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And scary. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're starting to use that kind of, I mean, what's the fear in all of that? Mm -hmm. You know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. uh, gender confusions. It was up to fathers to help boys find the correct path to masculinity. Uh, point man, the father needed to protect sons from feminization. Um, they will survive the scars and broken bones of boyhood, Pharaoh wrote, but they cannot survive being feminized. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, the whole page is yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, they want in the culture, they want the women to stay home and raise the children, but then they blame the women for. Not raising the man made up men. Right. Yeah. This is called, Emily, a double bind yeah. in psychology. Yeah. I mean, you can't win yeah. that way, right? Yeah. Um, um, all right. Stuff. Anything from uh, our friends on Zoom? Nobody has written me a question yet that I've missed. So, um, uh, over on 165, what did y'all think? As for its unmistakable presence in Scripture, no one could debate, debate the warrior imagery of the Old Testament, but Weber insisted that God was the warrior of both Testaments. The Apostle Paul, after all, was the ancient warrior, never to say guy kind of guy, who withstood imprisonment, torture, betrayal, and beating left him an inch from death. Rambo had nothing on him. And he would have done Louis L'Amour proud. And then was Jesus, the ultimate man, the complete hero. Um, too many men have become victors of demasculinized portrait of Christ, make it difficult for them to follow Jesus. Um, and and then I'm looking elsewhere for my manhood. Yeah. I got that foolish too. Exactly. Well, what's interesting to me, and I never really thought of this before, looking at Revelation as the image that you're going to pick up Jesus yeah. out of the book of Revelation. Yeah. I mean, that's a movement that in 37 years of ministry, I have never gone to. And I would want to argue in some ways that uh, trying to live out the vision of the Sermon on the Mount is a whole lot harder than any of this other kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting Claire. though because I think like a, a kind of very physical Christianity or kind of a muscular Christianity has been a part of the Christian tradition really all along. Yeah. I mean, with the desert fathers and mothers, you have these people 
in the early centuries of Christianity. Aesthetics for Jesus. Aesthetic yeah. lifestyles and extremes, um, where it's kind of all about being, it's not about being warlike, but it is about being, being physically enduring and strong, um, at least in part. And I think that's sort of a fascinating thing that that idea has maybe haunted Christianity across cultures and contexts. Um, I'm also thinking about atonement theory and how what was most accepted in the early church in terms of how the cross worked, why it did something for, for us, was that Jesus was victorious over the devil and was victorious over evil. And, and people didn't talk so much about, well, he was the atoning sacrifice for um any other, you know, he was showing us how to love any of these other atonement theories. They would just say, you know, Chris is Victor, he, he beat sin and death, he beat death. And so I think that's kind of interesting. It's like they might not have said we had a sword to beat death, but this idea that there was a winner and a loser and that life is won and death and lost um, was with us. So I, I think it's interesting to think about the proof text that people would use, like Revelation. That in my head, I'm kind of thinking, you know, it calls back to some other parts of tradition as well. Yeah, that's that's helpful. Um, I, I was thinking, you know, during the Middle Ages, the war, the night, you know, there there are times where that's been uh, very much. Um, well, let's move if we could. I realize we're running a little bit late. This was a long and for me a, a chapter that. Uh, a lot, but we need to get in on 166 and following um, complementarian theology and then the sexual purity movement. Um, and, and I, you know, Claire, I'm not wanting to put you on 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 uh, too much point, but you being younger than I and Emily, I suppose you too coming through college during some of these years um, and certainly seminary during some of this time, how how present was that in your Ken? Rhodes obviously is not, you know, uh, um, Wheaton, but uh, uh, I mean, I, I have done premarital counseling with couples, one of whom came out of a PCA background and you know, had been fed a, a steady diet of of uh, complementary theology, and having to help try to deconstruct that, and being very fearful that my deconstruction wasn't strong enough. Uh, yeah, any thoughts about that? Was that con was that concept new to you? I should ask this compartmental or uh, complementary theology, where that came from. I hadn't heard of it. It's never something that I would have taught. Right. And my college was a physical tradition. The college regularly was in Where Are you Swanee? Trinity. Oh, you're Trinity in Connecticut. I had you at Rhodes for some reason. My parents had it. Okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're Trinity Hartford. Okay, yeah, yeah. Who is it? The last page, the last line in this. Ties the Southern Baptist Convention mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, with Southern Baptism with this complementarian. Yeah. idea. they're paying some of the price for that right now. Right. Yeah. How that completely gets worked out. You know, women have certain roles, men have certain roles, and um, the black versus yep. white issue here is going to be a because African American. Churches have a significant number of women as ministers. It surprised me just to read about the willingness of the convention to just dismiss the um, what am I called deprived or these in some cases mega churches. Right. Um, and as Ken said, it is seeming indifference to whether or not they're going to. Yeah. Um, if if you've not had the opportunity to read the letter that Rick Warren sent before the vote, 
it is excellent. And it, uh, it articulates, I think, what has been historically the best of the Baptist church. And they completely turned away from, from that. Did you read it, Claire, by any yeah. chance? Uh, let, let me see if I can maybe uh, get a copy and send that around uh, in an email to you all this week. Okay. Yeah, you, you knew when they said no to Saddleback Church. Right. right? Yeah, they were serious about it. Yeah. Uh, this whole purity culture uh, stuff, I mean, man, uh, is there any wonder why the levels of depression in in teenage girls are as high as they are? Um, I was with somebody um, recently who's in the um, in the counseling field. And something came up for some reason, and he was talking about, oh, yeah, I remember growing up, and I was in the youth group, and there was this time when every boy got a sword. And he was like, so we were, like, running around with our swords, and I was like, just a second. <laughs> you were running around with your sword, and meanwhile, were the girls in your group getting little rings to put on their finger? And I was like, I don't think my eyebrows can go any higher. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, over on 171. And, and uh, just an FYI, I've not read any of these books. And I was not as uh, aware of a lot of this movement because it wasn't impacting the, the my theology or the theology of the church. And therefore, I wasn't as sensitive to the cultural movement across the country, right? I knew of purity culture, but I like, but 1997, I kissed dating goodbye. Uh, that book, I'm, I'm fairly certain, uh, Claire, there were uh, folks at seminary with you who had uh, read that book, and uh, yeah. And then, you know, what's really problematic in Mary, Andy, God bless you, uh, abstinence is the only sexual is sex education. How irresponsible is that <laughs> for us nationally, right? How utterly irresponsible. Um, just crazy. Yeah, just a little shy of my Southern Baptist side of the family. I love here with them. They are wonderful, wonderful people. And I'm very, very close to them. And, and they all have children about the same age. And I feel like, and two of them just came to visit in the garden. Uh, these little, um, they were talking about a wedding series. And I was just stunned because they're, they just, well, one of them still ready to graduate from college and the other one just graduated. And they said, Our car and grandma and all their friends get married? And I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're in like between the two of them five weddings in the next six months. Right. And you, you know what the, the language is on Christian college campuses? Ring before spring. Got to have ring by spring. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, um, and interestingly, I know back in the, gosh, when I was doing my doctoral research, uh, looking at some of the uh, trends of demographics in the PCUSA, um, and one of them is, so many of our women go on to higher education. And so we're having children later and fewer. And, you know, so that's one of the issues about, you know, growth and all of those kinds of things. But uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we, uh, we're seeing that in some of our kids. Uh, yeah, and yeah. there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a little uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But that was a little true the early 70s also. Yeah. Sure. Uh, when I was graduating from college. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, procreation to have children and, and making sure you're not stepping out. Yeah. Uh, Wild at Heart, John Eldridge. Any of you read that book? I remember going to some men's stuff where that was pushed and maybe looking at a page of it and thinking, uh, no, uh, I want I want to read some P.D. James right now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so my, is there any correlation with when age of marriage versus the success of marriage? That is, if you get married in your teens, the chance of divorce is significantly higher than if you get married in your late 20s. Uh, is there any correlation? I don't know of any statistics on that, Ken. Uh, yeah, I think I've seen that. I, I, I thought I had too. Yeah. It just means that if, if you're holding up this purity concept, right. it could mean that your marriage is going to be less successful. Yeah. yeah. All right, no more Christian nice guy, wild at heart. Um, Eldridge masculinity was thoroughly militaristic. Um, I gotta say, this chapter made me very scary. Um, um, God created all man for a long, for a battle, fight, to adventure, to live, and beauty to rescue. Um, wow. Um, I thought my chief end was to glorify God and enjoy God forever. Maybe I'm wrong. I obviously am reading the different uh, a different book. Um, Aggression, not tenderness. Is yeah. Part of masculine yeah. You know what's what's interesting to me in reading this. Um, I I read the Gospels as a critique of some of my worst natural inclinations, right? And that part of my task in discipleship is to let go of those natural imp you know, impulses uh, to conform my life in a way that can live ad maiorum day glory and give great glory to God, precisely out of the vision of the Beatitudes, of mercy and all of those kinds of things. And I see enough of that here. None of that. Yeah. Well, it seems like evangel um, evangelicals are quick to quote the Ten Commandments, and yet you never hear them quote the Beatitudes. I think I think that's fine. And, and again, I want to say that within the evangelical tradition, there are those for whom the Beatitudes are the heart. And, and so there's this war within the evangelical tradition over that. Uh, but thanks for saying that. Yeah. Um, one thing I've noticed in reading this is that uh, one of the many things they were evangelicals were against or maybe are against was the public school system. Right. And I kind of had some thoughts of why that is, but why is that? Because they couldn't control what was taught? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 I think that and they're no longer praying there and you know it's become you know group think and all of those kinds of things um yeah it's but said it helped uh emasculate them you know it just well and, and part, part of that i think was saying you know that boys have to sit and take tasks and there are some some things i've read about how you know school uh, works better for for girls than necessarily for boys, especially when you don't take allow recess and all those kinds of things. And so, what do teachers do now? They get the the balls that you can sit on and have restless leg syndrome and all those kinds of things. But um, you know, golly, we've had in the history of this country for a whole lot of years pretty successful public schools, and uh, one could argue is in many of our large urban contexts, the public schools started to decline when uh, forced integration was happening and the white families completely decamped from public schools. Um, I mean, I, I, I admit this is maybe not the place to make that argument, but I think um, the question, you know, really becomes, um, 
what is the focus? And, and there, there's a move, I think, um, in the last certainly 20 years to libertarianism as the effective political domination. And that is what, what's good for me? What do I get out for me? Instead of the question of what's good for us all? And how do we how do we value that best, right? That's that's a huge thing. Um, I read uh, an article this week, which I meant to forward to you and, and haven't yet. Um, and it's a wide sweeping article, but one of one of the things that he addresses is the public schools, and that the two things that happened legislatively at the same time were removing prayer from public schools and um, segregation, desegregation. Right. And that, and then the possibility, which can happen, of a Catholic president. And what they feared is that the tax dollars would go to Catholic schools. And so then with all that convergence of everything that happened, then people began to form their own schools, religious schools, and put their children there for two reasons. One, so they could pray, and they were white schools right. by and large. Um, and then he goes on to say, but they have no problem later in your later years wanting tax dollars right. to support their schools. Right. Exactly. And and what he was saying initially was, you know, Protestants had a pretty sweet deal. They they prayed in school and they liked that. Yep. Um, and when that was removed, then all sorts of other things started happening. Well, let's uh, let's move into this a uh, little bit. We've got about fifteen minutes uh, left. Uh, I'm over on one seventy. Well, let's go to one seventy four and then one seventy five. Braveheart, Mel Gibson's William Wallace, uh, American Cowboy also occupied a special place in his vision of masculinity. Um, and then over on 175, I wondered what many in the class thought about the sentence, the deep cry of a little girl's heart is I am lovely. Yeah. Am, I lovely. <laughs> am I lovely? Uh, yeah. I mean, what a what? deal. I don't think any of you men to know what the deep cry in this part is. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Yeah. And this was not just a passing thought at that time. Right. Our, yeah. Our little girls still live with that. Right. Our big girls. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Calvin College professors Mulder and Smith. I mean, it's good to see uh, folks are pushing back on this. Mm. Um, what Eldridge at, attributes to creation, biblical Christianity ascribes to the fall. Um, you know, again, good theology is a helpful thing. Um, over on 176, the time had come to toughen up American manhood, starting with boys. Uh, Dobson's bringing up boys, the masculine will to power. Talk about Nietzsche uh, being packaged. Uh, for our, our kids. Um, um, Did you see in that paragraph, feminists and liberals seem to think that top testosterone was one of, quote, God's great mistakes? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, then Phyllis Schlafly raises her uh, quaffed head uh, yet again. Um, I mean, uh, you know, she reminds me of in uh, popular culture. Uh, many of you, no doubt, had seen the Harry Potter movies. Mm -hmm. My probably favorite villain of the whole series is Dolores Umbridge, right? And uh, that's who the Schlafly reminds me of. <laughs> she was the school teacher that made Harry write you know and it gets written on the back of his hand and and there's that one marvelous scene where felch the the sexton of the school is putting up more and more rules um on on the door and there's a, another plaque goes up about what you can't do and i'm thinking 
somebody really gets this character. Uh, uh, over on 178, middle of the page, the concept of dominion was central to Wilson's definition of masculinity. Like Adam in the Garden of Eden, all men were made to exercise dominion. My theologians want to take that on at all? Claire Berry? I, this, this is not my thought, but what we were taught in seminary was to be careful of that word dominion, which appears in Genesis 1, because the sun is also given dominion over the day, and the moon is given dominion over the night. They don't destroy the world during that time. You know, they're given dominion to care, and the human beings, the human ones, are given dominion over the earth to care for it. Um, and not just to have power for its own sake, and certainly not to destroy or to harm. So I would bring that in. Yeah, it's stewardship. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not dominion in, in the way that uh, it's been exercised. That I have power for power's sake, and I can do with it as I please uh, for my benefit, and not for player Barry's benefit. Guy, yeah. I think that is a really important word in this whole book, yeah. is power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And whenever anyone exercises inappropriate power, I think that harkens back to anxiety yeah. and something else going on that it, this is all about power. Right. And what do I have to do to get power over someone who I view as less than me. Yeah. Uh, and even yeah. And evangelical who I I I like and I read and I've taught uh is Richard Foster. Mm -hmm. Some of you know a number of his books. Um uh, one when I was going through seminary had the intriguing title of Money, Sex, and Power. And it got repackaged into the challenge of the disciplined life. Oh. <laughs> uh, but I really appreciated how he took that on. And he basically said, you know, within Roman Catholicism, money, sex, and power was dealt with, um, you know, you, um, a, a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Where in the Protestant church, it was, um, tithing, it was faithfulness and marriage, and I can't remember what obedience was now, uh, but, uh, you know, that all of these are challenges for us as human beings, and how do we live out faithfully with those, but I think you're absolutely right, it's a, it's about power, and this, okay, will to power is a good thing, go, you know, go for it, is, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, there's uh, the, Bottom, bottom of 178, there's that quote that, uh, according to Wilson, marriage had three purposes, companionship, producing godly children, and the avoidance of sexual immorality. Okay. Um, man. Uh, yeah, probably not. Um, Young Sue, oh, here we are. This was that problem I had over on 179. Women must understand that they were, quote, led by a Lord, end quote. To this end, young suitors should be disruptively masculine, cheerfully interfering with the future wife's plans. Which usually had to do with education and career. Exactly. Yeah. And John, I wrote in the margin, crazy. No, <laughs> crazy. Um, yeah. And they were not as good as men in the important work of violence. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll take that. Yeah. Christian men's movement was nothing more than a discipleship program for weenies. Um, so, all right. Then we get into George H. or George W. Bush. Uh, the new millennium that ushered the new era for American evangelicals. Clintons were out of the White House. Cowboy president was back in the saddle. Of course, George W. Bush was brought his Crawford Ranch just before announcing his candidacy and made for a good photo op. I do not hear. Um, still, his faith was authentic. Uh, the moral certainties of the war on terror, framed as they were by the evangelical president, put an end to any post-Cold War uncertainty among evangelicals. Um, 
all of this. And then um, I have not heard of this book, King Me, uh, by Stephen Steve Farrer. Uh, like his point man, it illustrated the versatility of evangelical notions of militant masculinity. Masculine men were needed to save the nation from terrorists and defend against cultural forces that threatened America from within. Um, John Wayne comes riding back in, and then the passion, the movie. Um, in the trenches, you don't want tenderness. Um, I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I don't either. Yeah. Okay, I wondered what you all thought of 182, middle of the page. Uh, within the realm of Christian publishing that a man ought to cast the vote for his entire household. How's that for defranchising? <laughs> Are you out of your minds? Uh, yeah. No, but I know that wife asked her husband who she should vote for. Yeah. Wow. I can remember, oh, my, yeah. I can remember my mother yeah. going along with whatever my father said. Yeah, I was going to say. Is that right? Yeah. 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 This was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, here it is, over on 183. Christian fathers design initiation rites for sons, model on medieval knighthood involving expensive steak dinners and commemorated with symbols of great value, such as a Bible, a shotgun, or a plaque. Boy, that didn't happen in my household. Wow. Isn't this sort of son favoring sons versus daughters? Oh, yeah. So Jewish tradition where you have bar mitzvahs right. for the boys, and now recently they've changed to bath mitzvahs as well. Uh, yeah. But I, I don't think this is totally Christian mm -hmm. bias. Yeah, that's good. That's that's yeah, really helpful. Yeah. I thought this on uh, the bottom of 183 and 184 that uh, promise keepers uh, morphs, and instead of stand in the gap, it's now still in the gates. Wow. Um, all of this, the land letter, I had never heard about that at all. Um, and uh, this move after the 9-11 and into the early 2000s and the, um, that last story with Michael W. Smith at the Republican National Convention. Um, kind of sobering. All of this is very sobering. So yeah, I, I just find it disheartening that there is consistently such a, an eager audience for all of this, regardless yeah. how it repackages and yeah. morphs and evolves. There, there is an active yes. eager audience. Well, and and I do think you know again, young men who are anxious about their masculinity, and uh, we do know, you know. Um, for some, it's harder to find jobs, harder to find good jobs. Uh, think of some of the uh, the ways the culture plays with that. How many of you saw the the movie? Um, was it the Intern with uh, Robert De Niro? Robert De Niro and um, <laughs> Anne Hathaway is the 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 boss. But all of the the young boys who are working there who are absolutely clueless and you know put a shirt and tie on you know make yourself you know look I mean we we know that there are some uh, guys who are not kind of finding their way and I know I mentioned last week that Christianity Today podcast about the rise and fall of the Mars Hill Church. Sort of, you know, the the uh, the guys who were Kurt Cobain. Um, what was that movement? Uh, the grunge. grunge, you know, guy sort of really lost and hearing an uh, an authoritarian person saying these are the things you need to do to you know get out and become uh, you know a man in, in the world. And uh, so there there is unfortunately always a a group that is willing to 
you know, be led. And uh, we certainly saw that in Germany in the 1930s. And uh, unfortunately, we saw some of that in America in our own time and place recently. And so what are some of the things that are leading up to that? I mean, this militaristic uh, language uh, and Christianity is incredibly problematical uh, from my point of view. Uh, when I read the, yeah. at the top of page 184, we're just talking about switching from asking men to stand in the gap to storm the gates. Right. And I just immediately thought of January 6th. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you want to talk about grooming, right? Yeah. Grooming. Uh, come around. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, and thank you all. Carol West, we missed you in person. I hope you're well. Um, uh, Claire is going to be next week. The week after that is going to be uh, Carol uh, Busey. So, you know, you'll have real teachers the next two weeks. <laughs> Credential people, not just a, a, a simple local church pastor. So <laughs> we have cards. Cards, lots of cards. For Joe Lynn Hopton, who usually sits right there. And, and she, when she comes back, she'll look a lot like right. you. Yeah. She had a new, she'll have a new shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm standing in for her as new left shoulder person. <laughs> so grace and peace, all. Thanks. Thank you.